Fantastic presentations. Um, both of you were describing, if like if this is accurate, uh, sort of attempts to um, embed values. So I use the phrase embedding values. So there's like values embedded in renderings, architectural renderings, and uh, values embedded in children's bedrooms. Um, it's a good question for both of you. Do, do you think that they are um, sort of present, current values that are being embedded, or their attempts to define and prescribe values of, of the future, or, or desired values that perhaps aren't yet fully expressed? Well, I think um, for sure in um, architectural renderings, um, these values are aspirational. Um, I mean, these are renderings of uh, future environments that have yet to exist. So, and they're also trying to sell something. So, you know, they're trying to be sexy. They're trying to sell um, cultural values that uh, people wish to have for themselves. So, I think in my case, they're definitely um, prescribing certain values. Um, <clears throat> in my research, I think mine kind of fall into three categories. Um, for the sitcoms, to a certain extent, they're supposed to be representational. And the production designers that I interviewed um, made it a point to seek out merchandise that was relatable to a contemporary audience. They, um, you know, Richard Berg, who was the designer from Modern Family, had just had a baby and brought in some designs that he'd looked at for his own daughter in her nursery. Um, so in that sense, it's representational. And Maxine Shepard from Blackish actually went out in, into Compton, did research um, for some flashback scenes. And um, anyway, we're, we're shopping with brands familiar to a contemporary audience. One case study that I didn't discuss today is Land of Nod. Uh, I don't know if y'all are familiar with it, but it's a, a children's uh, furniture seller, <laughs> and it's owned by Crate and Barrel. And I looked at their catalog, and those spaces um, are kind of like Alex's renderings in a way. They're very aspirational. They're trying to sell something. Um, and the crisis nursery, I would say, is sort of prescriptive um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent um, because, I mean, they're choosing furniture that is modular, that's customizable, that's, um, you know, easy to move around and easy to adapt to different situations, which benefits them and also benefits the children. Is there a promise of perfection in examples like the Land of Nod and the hyper-realistic renderings where sort of free of imperfection, it's sort of the, the absolute, like, homogenized, ideal, smooth version of the future? It's styled chaos in the case of Land of Nod. It's, you know, like a little, literally a styled pile of blocks on the floor. Right. <laughs> I mean, definitely in the case of renderings, these are images of, you know, essentially fantasy lands. You know, um, homeless people don't exist in these representations of the urban environment. Um, you don't, you know, you don't see actual uh, things that you would see on a daily basis when you're walking in the street. So they're definitely very idealized and also, you know, um, the, the weather, the fact about the weather and all yeah. of these things. Um, it's not always sunny all the time, so, yeah. I'm interested in, in either of your uh, fields of research. Have you seen any counterexamples? Like, are there any rendering firms that are quite deliberately, for instance, showing, you know, future buildings in on a muggy day, on a cloudy day, or showing a more diverse population, or um, you know, representations of bedrooms that are. I mean, I suppose in some way the foundlings is, while not a representation, a more sort of honest, mm -hmm. like. Well, but they're still being used promotionally. Mm. Um, they're mm -hmm. they're publicly accessible to stakeholders in the organization. It, it's these are all images. Everything I looked at was an image. I was trying to keep it kind of uniform across the board in that way, and. Um, they're images that are available to the public, to board members, to everybody else. Um, so that actually makes it sort of difficult to say if there was anybody that was doing something very different. I mean, in Blackish, the room would get messy, but then the scene would change and right. come back and it's all cleaned up. Right. There's no Mary Poppins. Right. There's no true chaos. Yeah, and, Alex? and I think I think representations that are sort of try to counter that are more. Um, they're, they definitely they definitely exist. I think they're more theoretical applications, um, um, not meaning to actually sell architecture or sell real estate. And I think also a lot of students would employ um, those sort of techniques just to have some fun um, in their own renderings. But um, in terms of real estate renderings, where they're trying to you know um, sell you know high or very expensive apartments or whatnot, you know you don't want to include. <laughs> 
homeless people, for instance, in, in these sorts of renderings. So I was really struck by the, the, um, the array of news outlets that picked up the rendering. It was astonishing to me just like how many like how far and wide that got got spread is there a sense in which um a sort of a dream for the city's future becomes made more permanent or, or more static through that process i definitely think so and you know as i said before the whole hyper realistic aspect of of it makes it more permanent people don't even realize that they're renderings they think they're actually real so i think that definitely has an impact um, and it does lend a certain permanence to these images. And I, I think people sort of just accept them for what they are rather than challenge them. I mean, in the drawings of Hugh Ferris, um, there are obviously just suggestions. They're more abstractions. So people can sort of take that and use their imagination to, um, to just sort of imagine how they will play out into real life. But with a hyper-realistic rendering, there's less of that. There's less imagination. So there's room, <coughs> less room for people yeah, to exactly. imagine themselves. Fantastic. Other questions from, from the audience? Yes, sir. I'm going to pass the microphone around and um, please introduce yourself. I'll come here and then back to you. Excuse me. Uh, my name is Mike. Uh, I recently spent a few months studying abroad in Venice and thought a lot about and read about the idea that the city is becoming sort of a product and less of a place that's actually lived in. Um, and a lot of critics are sort of take issue with that because there seems to be so much to lose in a traditionally... Uh, a city that has a traditional historic center that's very ancient and um, rich with art and things like that, but in a place like New York City that maybe doesn't have a traditional historic center and especially maybe not in a place where a Hudson Yards is being built, what do you think is to lose with this sort of um, commoditization of a city as a product? Well, I think a lot of people, especially you know, native New Yorkers, take issue now with all of this gentrification and that's sort of the argument that the commoditization the commodification of the city has led to this gentrification and that you know it used to be this sort of dangerous artsy sort of um, cultural center and now it's filled with banks and chain stores and all of these things so I think that there's a lot to lose um, but also you know people would argue that economically it makes sense and if we want to continue being um, a city in this in this system, in this late global capitalist system, then this is you know, what needs to happen. Um, but I do think that there are um, cultural losses. Um, but yeah, just the way it is, I suppose. OK, excuse me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chi, and brava to both of you. This was great work. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about this sort of the continuum that we've we've accepted now of believing the artifice. And it, it strikes me that, um, especially what you were saying, Alex, is that we, we look at almost any image which has been highly manipulated and photoshopped, and we, we don't really question that anymore. We seem to have just accepted that as, as something that we may not think of as reality, but it's the artifice of a reality that we accept. And um, I mean, I don't think there's been a true image that's been un unmanipulated for a long time. And the, uh, the New York Times does not publish in the, you know, in the name of news a manipulated image. But any glossy magazine or anything that we see, particularly in the advertising sphere, has been highly manipulated. And I, and I just wonder, you know, have we just completely accepted that on, it, on its terms of being um, a way of selling something to us that we, we know is not real, but yet we, we somehow come to think we can believe. And I'm interested in, in your thoughts, both of you, on that. Um, well, do you want to do <laughs> um, well, you know, we, when you see people depart from that, it's um, a purposeful marketing tool, it seems like, like the Dove campaign, you know, um, which is to be lauded in certain ways, but also, I mean, it's just, it kind of sticks out in the marketplace. Um, you know, for my project, I considered looking at mommy blogs for a long time, but they're just as styled and, you know, as fake as everything else I've been looking at. You know, if you know that you're gonna have a camera around, like you're gonna clean up the mess and you're gonna kind of make it look perfect. Um, 
So I think it has. I mean, like, it really kind of has been internalized. Even Instagram, like, people rarely put something up without kind of tweaking it just a little bit, you know. Um, so it, I do think it's kind of built in now. But we also all know that it exists. So, I mean... Yeah, and I think um, in Derek's presentation, he discussed Marshall McLuhan's theory of um, sort of the medium is the message. And, you know, we're just sort of sort of our culture is saturated with this imagery that we don't really question it. It's just there and we don't even notice that it exists. So really, and even when I was talking with architects or renderers, um, this is all new to me. So I came in, I came into my research not really understanding how they produce these renderings. And you know, this is their work and they don't question it and you know, they just sort of do it. Um, so I think that's where it's important for a critic to come in, like a, a lay person, an, outside, an outsider, to really, to really look at it from that perspective and sort of critique it. Because when you're in the production process, um, you, know, you, don't, you don't question it because it's your work. It's, it's what you do every day. It's interesting. It's, I'm thinking back to like uh, Mark and Hortense and, and Jenny's session where we were talking about like design fiction and the opportunities <laughs> around that. It feels like maybe what's missing are like, signals of artificiality that we're not, you know, we're not defining very clearly where something is, uh, you know, made up and imagined versus where something is claiming to be real. It's interesting. Uh, another question. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Someone's phone is ringing. No, that's quite all right. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm a journalist and uh, multimedia artist. And uh, in my journalistic capacity, I covered what was the initial uh, push for what has resulted in uh, Hudson Yards, which is that uh, Dan Doctoroff's N NYC 2012 Olympics Fantasia. He began this in the 1990s, having attended World Cup matches at Giant Stadium in New Jersey. And uh, it, uh, prior to the final bidding for the NYC, or for the 2012 Olympics, what they had was something called the Site Evaluation Commission, a star chamber of 13 uh, IOC representatives that went from the five finalist cities. They had them go on a dog and pony show all over the city. I was a journalist covering that. And the reason I raise these issues is because the uh, rendering aspect is one element of a broader public relations push which has to do with the fact that uh, with something like the Olympics, which is uh, what I would call festival economics, is something that is sold as being good for everybody, but it always involves eminent domain, characterization of existing real estate as being underutilized or depressed, and there's some other uh, euphemism they use for it, but the idea is that we need to really increase the tax base, so we're going to um, eliminate businesses that are already there. They did that with all the... Uh, electronic stores where uh, World Trade Center was. Uh, point being, I'm, I'm curious in your background as a marketing communications person for architectural firms, how uh, this idea of eminent domain and uh, 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 the, the good for everybody, the, 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 uh, the kinds of euphemisms that are engaged are presented to, you, to architectural firms in their renderings, how that influences how they develop it how much, inf how much control they have over the development of these images, because it's really basically about uh, taking public and, and, and in some cases private land and developing it for private developers. Right, well, I mean, like you said, these renderings are created to brand these projects, so I think you know, a large part of it is um, convincing the public uh, to you know, accept them as real, as, as they're going to happen. So um, I'm sorry, I sort of <laughs> lost track of what your question was. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, much of, so much of the, uh, I mean, really, basically, it's, it's, it's taking, and, and you also mentioned the Bloomberg's uh, rezoning. That's, an, that's another aspect of this. You're basically taking uh, both public lands and also lands used by public or, uh, private businesses to transfer them and transferring them under a, a, a principle that this is going to benefit everybody. This is going to create a bigger tax base. They did it with the Yankees. The Yankees have got a massive tax abatements. And it's, 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 it's like what I would call festival economics. So I'm just wondering to what degree architectural firms in their renderings are just simply 
trying to cover their own asses and, 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 and get the, the work to, to do the, the, the business, or, or is there is there more of a politicized way the projects are presented to the firms to develop the most attractive kinds of renderings? Um. I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, I, my research really focused on renderings and Hudson Yards was sort of just a, you know, a case study of mine, um, examining the renderings themselves. But I mean, they are branding tools. So I don't know about covering their asses, but they're definitely trying to, trying to sell something. Um, sorry, that doesn't answer your question. No, 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 that's great. Um, <laughs> one more question, I think, and then we should probably wrap up. Yes, please, I'm gonna pass the microphone this away. I'm just wondering if you went into any research on just sort of people's reactions to these after the fact, because the thing with like renderings, Hudson Yards obviously hasn't been completed yet, but if there's other examples, um, is there, with this hyper-realism as contrasted with, you know, historic examples of the charcoal drawings, is there more of a reaction in your research to like elements that were not included that were promised in these renderings? And in the same way, um, kind of going back to some of the previous presentations, um, just sort of the ability to um, improvise that, that exists within those charcoal drawings, it's not strictly defined. Mm -hmm. And so there's everything within the rendering is so defined that some of this sort of um, community stuff that might happen or you know, the improvised things that might show up in the project after the fact are not, um, not allowed for, I guess. There's no flexibility, right? So did you, did you see any sort of um, pushback from the community or reactions to these renderings after projects were built that, that addressed either of those? Well, I didn't actually study um, any projects that have been built where you could sort of compare um, the before and after, but I mean, it's been known that, you know, renderings don't look like reality. And I mean, these are obviously idealized representations and Hudson Yards is not going to look like those renderings. Um, so yeah, I think um, initially, I don't know that the community expects them to look exactly um, as they appear. Um, it's more just a, sort of overall gesture, I guess, to, to, um, to show that something good is going to happen, not necessarily that this is exactly what it's going to look like, but that it will benefit everybody. So I think it's more just a gesture as opposed to, you know, this is actually what it's going to look like. I don't think people actually have the expectation that, um, you know, Hudson Yards is going to look like that. Oftentimes, actually, in most cases, renderings real uh, developments don't look like the renderings. Thanks, Alex. I'm just gonna uh, bring Lila back in one, one more time before we end. I'm interested in, um, I was struck by the, the, the Kanye uh, and Kim Kardashian photograph. I mean, I, do you know if renderings are used in that context as well? <laughs> I mean, pr presu presumably they, they've sort of designed that, uh, that environment for their child very, very carefully. Uh, or, or at least do you see a link between the two? Um, I can certainly see a link between the two. I mean, um, you know, I didn't look at any of the production designers, like storyboards or, you know, uh, kind of mock-ups, but I'm sure that, you know, there was probably a model made at some point. Um, but that's, but I don't know that they do digital renderings like that. Right. I mean, just Alex has told me what some of these things cost, and it's just, like, outrageous. Um, so I don't know if it would have been cost prohibitive or not to, to actually mock something up like that. You're assuming there's a production designer for Northwest's bedroom? I think we can safely well, I, safely assume that, yeah. I'm sorry. At I least the, five of them. <laughs> sorry, I just totally made the leap to sitcoms, didn't I? But um, <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm definitely <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Um, I think on that note, a huge congratulations to Alex and Lila.